Before we get started with today's episode, I would like to quickly read you our podcast disclaimer. This podcast is for educational purposes only, and it is not to substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. You should always speak with your physician or other healthcare professionals before doing any fasting, changing your diet in any way, taking or adjusting any medications or supplements, or adopting any treatment plan for a health problem. The use of any other products or services purchased by you as a result of this podcast does not create a healthcare provider-patient relationship between you and any of the experts affiliated with this podcast. Any information and statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. All right, and now we'll get started with today's episode. Hi everyone, it's Megan Ramos here and welcome to a new season and new episode of the Fasting Method Podcast. Today, I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Terry Lance. Terry, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Megan. We've gotten through that month of August that we talked about before, so things are going well. Yeah, it's it's been a busy summer. Lots of travel for so many people in our community, which is really nice. It's exciting to get out there again. But I know a lot of people are feeling eager to get back into routine after Labor Day. So many of our community members and coaching clients say they're feeling tired, sluggish. It's just been too much food, too weird schedules, and they just want to get back into their regular fasting and eating routines. I think for many people, this is actually a very unique time of year, though we could probably identify these times throughout other stages of the year. But coming back after summer, coming back after all of that, And on the horizon, people see three months away, holiday seasons begin for many people. And for some people currently in a holiday season now. And so we we have these periods of time between those more kind of chaotic times. And so I think it's really important for you and I to talk a little bit about framing that for people. How do they not fall into the traps of this three month push and what they expect of themselves. And I know you've been through a number of this season with people in your coaching and in the community. So I'm curious, some of your thoughts about what do you see people struggle with or kind of pitfalls that they take during this time? I feel like everybody comes back the Tuesday after Labor Day and it's like they hop on a treadmill and they turn it as fast as they can go because for them, Thanksgiving is going to be here in the blink of an eye and they're feeling panicked because summer is unpredictable. Sometimes things don't go as planned. August is one of those months where things can start to fall apart a bit. So people might be up a couple of pounds or they didn't hit their weight loss goals over the summer. And there's a lot of heightened anxiety. And I feel like so many people that we've worked with every year at this time try to go from zero to 100. They might not have really been practicing time-restricted eating, not snacking, you know, even not being able to do 24-hour fasts on a regular basis. So they want to hit the ground running and immediately jump into something like five days or 10 day fast, or, you know, they're going to do two 66s, something really intense right off the bat. And there's just so much fear and anxiety about this short window of time they have. I think one of the important things from a mindset perspective then with that, Megan, is that people really, I encourage them to really think about this is three months of my year-long journey, of my multiple year journey. And so what do I want to focus on in these three months? And I encourage people to focus less on the results they put pressure on themselves to create and to see in these three months and more on the habits they want to build in these three months. Because if they can work on building good habits in these three months, 
They're going to get through their holiday season differently. They're going to head into the new year differently, and they'll be able to carry through and reach the goals into the future. But when they put that short timeline on it and expect themselves to lose 25 pounds by the beginning of the holiday season or lose anything that they gained over the summer, it's just almost setting them up for failure. And then when you feel that defeated, it's really hard to make any positive changes. So I really encourage people to reframe this next three months, this next season here as a habit building season, a time when they can focus on really building strong foundational skills. Many of them are skills they've already built at one point, but they've gotten so far away from that they're no longer using them. So bring back the foundational skills refresh them, get them working again before trying to increase that fasting dial and do those huge kind of leaps and bounds strategies to get big results quickly. I've shared this before and I'll share it again. It was right after my wedding and we had been in Florida for three weeks. We got married in Orlando at a Disney resort. It was a stressful time, a good time, but still stressful. And my eating quickly went sideways during those few weeks. And I got home and I panicked like so many of our members do. And my first inclination was to do something like a seven day fast. I had done a hundred of them at this point. And, you know, I thought, okay, I can do it. And then I thought, no, you would not tell one client, one community member to do a seven day fast right now. And I thought, okay, we need to do the opposite of what inner panicked Megan is trying to do right now. And the opposite was to sit into a fat fast for two weeks, you know, as long as it took till I began naturally fasting again, not having the cravings. And I spent two whole weeks in a fat fast. The last few days I had started naturally doing 24s. And when that started to happen, I said, okay, Let's grocery shopping for the week ahead. I'm gonna get into some 42s, mix in some 48s here and there, and I'll see how it goes. But within about 12 weeks, I hit my lowest body fat percentage ever. In fact, I hadn't seen a drop in body fat percentage like that. And at this point, I was already at the lower end of the body fat range. So it takes so much more effort to lower the numbers when they're already on the low side of things. It's easy to come from a very high body fat percentage to a medium or lower body fat percentage, but to get to that optimal place, it's very difficult. And most people, when I share the timeline, they can't believe that I spent two weeks doing that fat fast, but it set me up for success. And so often throughout my own health journey, when I learn a new skill like fasting, or when I learn about a new dietary routine that might be helpful, or I get new lab results about something and I see that I could pivot how I'm doing something, our inner drive often tells us to go 100 miles per hour in that direction. And I have to stop myself every time and say, okay, if I do that, I'm going to crash and burn just as fast as I try to take off. So what is the one minimal thing that I can do that I know I can be successful at at this moment? And it led to pretty profound changes. And this is something I've always really struggled with the coaching uh, clients and trying to get them to slowly ramp up the dial after a holiday like summer. And there's so much fear about not wanting to start, you know, the new year off weighing a certain weight or on certain medications. And you really only see this, you know, 12 week window until the holidays start to come. What are some ways that you talk to our community and address this mindset and try to help people say, hey, it's okay if I don't run 100 miles per hour right now. I think you've really nailed it. There's actually a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And it talks about the difference in these two general systems of thinking. And one is very fast, instinctive, and emotional. So someone coming back from August vacation wants to hurry up and lose 10 pounds, wants to get right back on track. 
And the other system is much slower, more deliberate and more logical. It's based on reasoning. And I think this is where we want to encourage people to slow that down and know that you have to rebuild the foundation now so that the payoff is actually better. Reminds me a little bit when you use the discussion around um, fat loss for men versus women. And in the beginning, men lose fat more quickly and women, they catch up. And I think we put so much pressure on ourselves that we have to do all of this quickly. And we get so caught up in the timelines that I need to be at this weight by this date versus this time is going to pass whether I pass it with a lot of stress and pressure on myself, or if I work on this slower journey of building the process, getting the skills back, setting it up so that my body can succeed. Sometimes I think oftentimes people act as if they just power through it, their body will do what they want it to do instead of taking the time to build a system that your body can actually use. So like you said, you used a system that for some people, they might think there's no way that could work. And your results were better than if you had jumped into some big long fast. So for people just to give themselves that time to develop what they actually need longer term, not the race, you know, it's the tortoise and the hare right now. Everyone wants to be the hare and go really fast. Who wins the race? The tortoise, the one who plans and takes the steps necessary. One of my favorite times in the year at the clinic, when we had our clinic in Toronto, was January. And you people listening right now must think, oh, Megan's an awful person. Why does she like January? Why does she like January weigh-ins? But one of the things that I loved about it was showing our patients how weight loss resistant they become. So a lot of our patients had some really serious health issues. Fat loss, of course, was a goal for so many people because weight gain was the side effect of their insulin resistance and their metabolic health issues. But a lot of them were in really bad shape health-wise. So we really focus a lot on different biomarkers that weren't the scale for the majority of the year. Every time a patient came in, they got their whole lab history. There's a whole spreadsheet. We wanted them to monitor trends and we we're very hyper focused, you know, sort of on the glucose and the insulin levels and the insulin resistant markers. And for most of the year, our patients didn't think too much about their weight. They would see weight loss and it would happen and it would come in spurts. Sometimes they'd see a lot, sometimes they'd see a little, but they were always seeing inches change. But January is one of the times where people were a little bit more sensitive to what that scale showed. And they would show up to the clinic and say, oh, you're not going to be so mean. You're not going to make us do this. And I said, yes, I am. I am. And they would get on the scale and I would break out my trusty old <laughs> measuring tape and they've lost inches. They've lost weight. And they would just look at me like they had seen a ghost, like there is no way any other December holidays, they would have gained six pounds, 10 pounds. How the heck did they lose two pounds? Because their focus so much was on healing their insulin resistance. And that weight loss became the side effect of doing that. Another side effect of doing that is weight gain resistance. So it was really awesome for them because they got to see it and experience it and say, oh my gosh, all these little things that we do, all of the focusing on the glucose and the hormones, all of that not only is helping me lose weight, but it's making me resistant. And I loved having holiday after holiday with these patients because they grew to really like the holidays again, whether it was summer vacation and they were going home to Australia for a month to spend it with family, or if it was the December holidays, they realized that they had done such deeper healing that they became weight loss resistant. So I like to share this a lot with our community and our coaching clients, because if we focus on these habits that Terry's talked about doing during this particular time, we're really going to heal the insulin resistance. And when we do that, we're going to be able to not just lose weight, but maintain it and struggle to gain weight. 
And it's always so incredible to me how I'll have these vacations or these holidays and the scale doesn't budge at all. And sometimes it can even go down a little bit depending on the duration of the holiday. And it's because I've done the deeper healing and I focus on all of these little strategies that are so important for regulating my hormones. I think that's something that the fasting community at large would be wise to think about. You know, this isn't a race towards losing 25 or 35 pounds before Christmas. This is, you know, about focusing on healing the deeper metabolic issues and then being able to enjoy Christmas and not think about what that scale is going to say in January because you're truly in control of your health and your waistline if you're able to tackle that insulin resistance. I think that piggybacks with something I was just thinking about, Megan, and that it's a mindset thing. It's about creating the identity that you want. And, you know, this is a theme that I go back to on almost every topic that we want to create an identity for ourselves of I'm someone who's healthy. I'm someone who eats to support my health. I'm someone who sees a future for myself as someone who's healthier. And then, of course, the weight loss goes hand in hand with that, rather than what many of us are still caught up in is thinking of ourselves as unhealthy, as overweight, and as a dieter. And a dieter diets for a period of time and then stops. And what you just talked about when you were working with people in the clinic is they weren't doing a diet. They were learning about health factors. They were learning about behaviors that create a healthier body and behaviors that interfere with a healthier body. So they got out of diet mentality. But many people right now in this community are sliding back into diet mentality. I've got three months to lose the weight and then I don't have to do this. Uh Uh-oh, and then I have to come back to it in January maybe versus work on creating the identity. I'm a healthy person who has a healthy body weight and the decisions I'm making now create that. So getting out of diet mentality, getting out of the belief system that if I push really hard for these three months, I can then just coast through the holidays. That's not really how it works. And I think your experience in the clinic really helps to to show that. There is this quote from Dr. Edith Egger. So she's a psychologist. She's based in San Diego. I heard it on a podcast in the functional health space. She said, your kids don't do what you tell them to do. They do what you do. That just really hit me at the time because we were starting to go through some fertility treatments and there was just sort of a lot of reflection going on in my mind about parenthood. Ever since hearing that quote, I thought about all of my actions from a whole different perspective. And on those days where it's been difficult to go to the gym, I've gone to the gym. On those days where it's been difficult to do some self-care or on those days where I could just really skip a meal when the baby does need some protein, it's just really helped frame things. But thinking recently about this chain of thought, that I was having and sharing with my husband. He said, you need to do that all of the time with your health. You thought about healthy Megan and you know, what does healthy Megan do? Does healthy Megan eat this stuff? Does healthy Megan not eat this stuff? And he said, you, you know, when you're going through your journey and when you were sharing with me, when we started dating, you know, a lot of it was talking about these goals and being that healthy mom. And he's like, you've always been in that mindset. You're just looking at it from different lenses right now. And he's right. Cause I, I grew up with a very sick, unhealthy mom. So, so much of my focus has been wanting to be a healthy mom for for my kids and my family. So they don't have to spend all their summer vacation at hospitals and sleep in emergency room waiting rooms. And something that we've always come to our clients and community with is that there needs to be a deeper why than just weight loss. And when the why shifts away from weight loss or certain weight loss goal, that's when we really start to see progress. That's when a lot of the pieces of the puzzle click. That's when the anxiety to hit these milestones starts to go away and we don't fixate on you know that 25 pounds before Thanksgiving. What are some of your thoughts around sort of redefining the why as we head into this fall season? 
I definitely think that's really important. And I know sometimes people get a little frustrated when I talk about the why. And sometimes I say for many of us, weight loss itself isn't strong enough. Now, we might have other things attached to weight loss that are really important to us. We have people in the community that are new grandparents and they want to be the grandparents that are mobile and active and can do great things with their grandkids. So weight loss is part of that health. So focusing on accomplishing what they want to do, build the habits they want to build by envisioning themselves as that healthy grandparent who is mobile, gets to see their grandkids graduating and getting married. Like you have to start really um, creating a life of longevity and mobility now rather than I need to lose these 25 pounds. So I definitely think that creating the life that you want, I know it can sound kind of cliche when we say that, but this is about creating your life in a healthy way that you want it to be, that you want to be mobile, you want to be independent. Many people in our community will talk about their vision of, you know, 20 years from now, what do they want to be able to do as far as self-care or do they want to rely on other people to care for them. I think these are even more important, that deeper why, why is that 25 pounds really important? It's because it's tied to the health, it's tied to the longevity, it's tied to the mobility. And then every now and then people say, but what if part of my why is what someone might think is more vain? I want to look good in my clothes. I think that's healthy too. I just find that for many, many people, It doesn't have teeth enough to make them follow through on those tough moments. Like you said, when you don't want to go to the gym or when you don't want to eat the right things that help your body, I think we need some deeper reasons. So digging into your why during this time of year could be really important. A woman in one of my large community meetings one day said this and everyone's eyes lit up. They were so excited. She said, you know, sometimes we talk about the why and we talk about finding your big why and she said that doesn't really work for me i don't have one big why but i know this is really important so i started working on creating a list of a hundred whys so anytime she doesn't want to do the thing that she knows would be good for her she could start reading through that list it's not just one thing she's got a hundred reasons why taking care of herself is important to her And I think that's a really powerful way to look at it. Throughout my journey, everybody knows in so many months I lost so many pounds, this and that. But I never actually really weighed myself much during my actual journey. I was so terrified by my diabetes diagnosis and then learning about insulin and learning about inflammation and following all of these biomarkers. And so at six months, I hit this really cool A1C marker. And it was my goal to completely inverse the two. I was 6.4 and I wanted to get to 4.6. And that was when I was going to scale things back uh, at the time. So at six months, I hit that. And I did weigh myself. But I didn't actually weigh myself till I had been away with some friends. And people took photos. And I saw those photos afterwards. And I thought, oh, damn, I look good. (laughs) Um, I hadn't really enjoyed a photo of myself in a long time, but I had just totally realized in that moment that I hadn't paid attention to that at all. And I knew I was wearing smaller sizes. I ended up just buying leggings. So I wasn't seeing things change as drastically in terms of clothes, but it's really hard to see yourself on a regular basis and notice changes in body composition. But that really struck me. And then I did weigh myself and I saw the the weight loss. And I was like, well, this is a really cool side effect of getting healthy. Mm -hmm. For me, it's always been a side effect of getting healthy. I always really try to discourage clients when they say, oh, you know, so-and-so is getting married in November and I need to be down 30 pounds for that wedding. Well, why? You know, (laughs) you know, we don't want to lose 30 pounds of lean mass. So you know, we've got to focus on making you healthy. And the weight loss, the stuff, it will 
come in time. The vanity stuff will come in time, but you're just going to end up tripping over your feet. So don't focus on that. Let's focus on other goals. Is there another goal? Your morning blood sugar levels, your blood sugar levels two hours after you eat, something on your lab test results, a CRP that's 30, you know, bringing that down, triglyceride levels that are 500, bringing that down. Um, let's focus on that and have something that we can do and focus on the objectives, the strategies to bring us there. And then you'll see the weight loss comes. And people ask me all of the time about characteristics that individuals possess that make them very successful. And it's really those who focus on the weight loss being the side effect of their good health. They're able to reach their goals and they also leave yesterday in the past. They don't hyper-focus on how a weekend or a week could have gone one way but didn't. It was what it was and today is a new day and they implement the skills and strategies they need to balance their sugars and balance their hormones and they know the weight loss will come just by focusing on that. And those are some of the, the characteristics that the most successful people I've worked with have possessed. I think another piece I would add to that is people recognizing all of the other things that come things that come to them more subjectively rather than the objective you can measure you can you know test this and test that which are amazing things but also i think for so many people one of the big motivators once they're aware of it is the food freedom they feel when they don't feel bound by food or bound by eating I sometimes am still amazed that when I'm traveling and maybe it's been hours since I've eaten or maybe I haven't eaten yet that day and I get on the plane and I sit down and I get through my flight and I get to the airport again and I go through that airport and I don't have any need to eat. Whereas before I was eating every hour and a half connected to that travel day. So the freedom that getting healthier creates when your insulin resistance decreases and you're not having the cravings all the time. When my thoughts weren't about food every second of the day, that was so liberating. And so again, not only the things that you can tangibly measure, but the things that you can experience, not feeling compelled to eat all the time or compelled to eat foods that you know are harming you, that is so freeing for so many people. Another thing too that we hear often about is the hangriness, which is a product of reactive hypoglycemia. I was actually just reading in the Facebook group about how someone said, you know, they can't really fast beyond 18 hours because they get hangry. How are all of these people fasting for 24 hours? And I think sometimes people think that if they experience that hangriness, that they must have good glucose metabolism or they must not have insulin issues because their body needs to eat and they're getting irritable because they're not. But that's actually a sign of reactive hypoglycemia, which is a precursor to developing type 2 diabetes. So when someone says, oh, I get hangry and I can't fast beyond 18 hours, I need to eat, I need to eat, I need to eat then that's a big red flag for me that they really need to fast beyond 18 hours because they've got this reactive hypoglycemic issue. They've got too much circulating insulin that's driving their blood sugars too low. They're hyper responding to the foods that they're consuming. So they need to fast. They need to lower and regulate their insulin levels and develop insulin sensitivity and they need to work on their diet. So many of these people that experience this hangriness, you know, they really think that they're in the handcuffs of the food and they're not. And that's always something that's really cool to hear too from members who would say, oh, you know, I, if I skip dinner, you know, my family didn't like me and they thought I was tired and crabby to not even having to think about it and just living life and being a joyful family or social participant in whatever it is that you're doing without having these hormonal swings that are governed by you needing to eat throughout the day. Or needing to take a nap right after the meal. I think a lot of us just assume that's normal. Oh, I ate a big meal, I'm gonna need to sleep. Nope, <laughs> that's a sign that that didn't work well for you and, and fasting and eating the right foods is gonna be much more helpful. 
Well, Terry, I think we've given people a lot of things to think about going into the fall, about slowly dialing things up, focusing on the habits, the insulin resistance, and just letting the weight loss happen. Now, for those of you who are listening, last year at this time, Terry, Nadia, and I recorded an episode with our top tips and strategies from a fasting and nutrition perspective to help people ease back into successful strategies as well. So go back, listen to last year's episode to get those fasting and eating tools. But this year, try to implement some of the mindset tools that we've discussed in today's lesson. And we'll see you back here next week with another episode of the Fasting Method Podcast.